Thank you all very much for being here. It is kind of a full circle tonight. We've done about, as Dave said, 400 talks in about three years now in 40 states. So it's good to kind of be back where we began. Um, we are at the point where nobody should be deceived about what Common Core is. There is no debating it anymore. There is no doubting it anymore. We've had plenty of time to see all this in action. I'll show you a lot of what I mean today. We now know what Common Core is. And so this is not going to be one of those talks that I have had to give about 400 times, uh, explaining to people who really don't know what it is, what it is. It is a sad commentary that after six years of Common Core, after hundreds of talks and thousands of talks by others as well, 90% of every audience I've spoken to still, still, as recently as two weeks ago in New Jersey, still doesn't know what Common Core is. Mm -hmm. That's why Common Core is winning. Common Core isn't going anywhere in the short term because too many people still have no idea what it is. And so rather than give you a talk again explaining what it is, I, try, I see so many friendly, supportive faces, people who have helped us do this over the years. Uh, no point in going back over that old territory. What I'd like to do is break my talk up into two parts. One of those parts is called farce because this is a farce and we'll talk about what that means. And the second part of my talk is failure. Uh, how we know na now know that this whole thing was doomed to fail from the beginning and as every week goes by there's more evidence that it is a failure. So starting the talk with farce. What is farce? Farce is absurdity. Farce is something that starts tragic but ends up laughably absurd and that's where we are with education in this country today. Um, for our quote we're going to go to somebody who understood how history could be transformed into farce. Karl Marx, right? Karl Marx said history repeats itself. First is tragedy, second is farce. You saw Alex Newman's wonderful talk about the history of education. And so Alex took you back over 100 years to show you how American education went from the best in the world, the freest in the world, the most freedom promoting in the world, the most equitable in the world, how American education over the last 100 years went from all of that to being a tragedy. A tragedy of failed expectations, a tragedy of lost generations of kids, a tragedy of too much corporate involvement, too much meaningless testing, too little real accountability. We're at the point now where this is farce. What Marx meant by that is, if you win the battle of history, if you tragically transform freedom into tyranny, success into low expectations, if you do that, that's the tragedy. Everything that comes next is farce, and Common Core is nothing but pure farce. Start with, we all remember this guy, let's talk about farce. This is John Gruber, you may remember. He's the, one of the architects of Obamacare. He's the man that the taxpayers, you and I, paid over $4 million over the last five years to consult on the implementation of Common Core. And here's what he has to say about how it got passed. If you had a law which said healthy people are going to pay in, it made explicit that healthy people pay in and sick people get money, it would not have passed. Okay, just like the people, transparent, lack of transparency is a huge political advantage. And basically, you know, call it the stupidity of the American voter or whatever. But basically, that was really, really critical to getting the thing to pass. So, you see what we mean by farce, right? Uh, transparency is hugely, we couldn't have passed, if we'd have told you what it was, Nancy Pelosi, right? If we had you read it before we passed it, you never would have passed it. Call it the ignorance of the American voter, if you will. They've got us busy with all, a thousand different crises every week, right? trying to pay mortgage, gas prices, keeping up with everything. Lack of, trans, lack of transparency is a huge advantage to those who would turn tragedy into farce. Common Core, say what you will about Obamacare, disastrous as it was, is, it was voted on in the House and the Senate. It was uh, appeared before the Supreme Court, right, where it had a hearing. None of that was done with Common Core. Nobody was consulted about Common Core. I've said many times in my talks that this education reform is every bit probably more dangerously transformational than even healthcare because you're getting kids, kids as young as five and seven and nine and 12, and you are completely warping them with regards to how to view their own government, how to view their civic responsibilities. You're shielding from them critical information about what's made this country successful and fundamentally decent. You're shielding that information and you're replacing it with a lot of loaded propaganda and of that type. So keep Mr. Gruber in mind as we walk our way through some aspects of Common Core. The NEA farce, well, I want to add one thing to what Alex uh, taught you about the history of this country. Take the NEA, the National Education Association, arguably the most visible guide of American public education for the last 70, 80 years. 
starting in 1948. Quotes from 1948 through 1970, right when American tra education was completely trans, it became, stopped being a tragedy and became a farce. And what I think is really remarkable about the years 1947 and 1948, as this country was winning the bloodiest war in human history, beating back ultimately both communism and fascism, as we did that, as the greatest generation gave the ultimate sacrifice to ensure liberty and freedom, our educational mentors, our educational guardians were already plotting the overthrow of that through public education. 1947, the NEA, far too many people in America, both in and out of education, look upon the elementary school as a place to learn reading, writing, and arithmetic. Well, how dare you? <laughs> right? the idea, and, and that's where a lot of us are today, right? A lot of Americans are waking up and say, well, what happened to reading, writing, and arithmetic? They had no intention of leaving it that way. You heard about Horace Mann and you heard about John Dewey, right? Education for international understanding involves the use of education as a force for conditioning the will of the people, right? This is globalism, this is uh, UN, this is UNESCO that El uh, Alex talks so eloquently about, right? The purpose of modern American education in post-war, post-World War II, in the post-World War II world was to transition American kids, not to teach them how to read, to write, critical thinking, but to tra transition them to global existence, global citizenship. And by the time you get to 1969, right, schools will become clinics whose purpose is to provide individualized psychosocial treatment for the student. And teachers must become psychosocial therapists. You can see in that 22 year period how much of what is modern Common Core, this emphasis on sociology, this emphasis on social transformation, this emphasis not on mastery, but on po politics and ideology. In that short window, history became farce, right? At the moment of America's greatest triumph, not just for our country, but for all of humanity. At that moment, the whole thing was being subjugated, right? subverted. Let me give you a couple examples. Talk a lot about Common Core. I'll show you as we move forward that one of the big great lies of Common Core that they're still peddling is that it was somehow state-led. It was somehow led by governors. It was somehow democratically operated. Uh, you've heard, uh, was it P.T. Barnum who said, if you're gonna lie, lie big. The big lies are always the ones that are the easiest, more, most easily believed. But let's just start with the feds. Let's start with what I call federalizing farce. Let's start with Arne Duncan, because if you listen to the people in charge of federal education in this country, not just the unions, the NEA, but certainly the uh, Department of Education Secretary, the chief educational officer in the land, a man, by the way, who really has no practical teaching experience. He's never been a classroom teacher. He doesn't know what teachers go through. He's a sociologist by trade, which is interesting. How did we get a sociologist in the chief educational office in the country and not, you know, an educator? Because, as it's now clear, Common Core was never meant to be about education. Common Core is not about, it never was intended to make your kids better, brighter, stronger, more competitive. It was always, always intended to socio sociologize them, to change the way they think, not in terms of skills, but in terms of politics and ideas. And here's what uh, uh, Mr. Duncan said back in 2009 when the whole scheme was getting rolling about the role of American schools in this new world. I think our schools should be open 12, 13, 14 hours a day. So it's not just lengthening. So eight to eight or something like that? At home, we attached health care clinics to about two dozen of our schools. Where schools truly become the centers of the community, great things happen. And this is a chance to really create what I think the 21st century school has to look like. This needs to be the norm, not the exception. Time matters tremendously, and all of our families need our doors open longer. Is now. this a big ticket item in terms of financial resources? Uh, finances is a piece of this, and you, we, again, have significant financial resources, unprecedented financial resources coming to table. But let me be clear, this is thinking differently and being creative. Thinking differently, being creative. But the irony is, is there's nothing different about this. They've been thinking this way through the 60s and then through the 40s, pre-World War II, through Dewey and back through John Rockefeller and all the way back to Horace Mann. They've always been thinking this way. There's nothing new or different about this. They're not implementing a new plan. They're, they've reached the zenith of their ability to transform these schools. And did you hear the faux pas he said? He called the schools stores at one point. He had a verbal slip. Our stores need to be open 24-7. Your daughter, your 12-year-old daughter brings two might all to school. She can be th suspended and expelled from class. But they're now opening clinics, building new schools with clinics attached, right? Because this, this, we want our schools open 8, 12, 14 hours a day. We want them open seven days a week. 
We want our kids to be there all the time. We want them to become the centers of the community. We want the schools to do your parenting. You now have breakfast, lunch, and dinner served in all the, at school at all the major uh, cities in this country by the public schools. You have uh, uh, communities winning grants from the federal government to continue to feed American children all summer long. Because if you feed them for nine months, the idea they have, the federal government of your family, is that you can't feed your kids, you won't feed your kids. If the schools feed them for nine months, three meals a day, then your kids are obviously going to starve to death before classes start in September. So uh, school districts like Memphis, Tennessee, have won big federal grants to, to open their schools in the summer all day to feed breakfast, lunch, and dinner to kids. And of course, as we've been told, it's discriminatory to only give free breakfast, lunch, and dinner to those kids who are financially needy. So we've got to give it to all kids now. Right? We've got to make all kids. And, and this is not about generosity. If they're feeding all your kids, including the wealthy kids, because that's socially just, then they're replacing you. And that's part of what this is. Uh, Arnie Duncan, uh, very recently, we go from 2009 to just this month. And the one idea I threw out that uh, I wanted to sort of road test it with the kids who they thought is the idea of public boarding schools. And that's a little bit of a you know, different idea or a controversial idea. But the question is, do we have some children where there's not a mom, there's not a dad, there's not a grandma, there's just nobody home. And there are certain kids we should have 24-7. Boarding schools. And think about the logic of that. Do you know of any of those places? Do we actually have homes in this country where nobody's present but kids in them? Do we actually have that? No moms, no dads, no grandmas, no grandpas, no cousins, no dogs, just kids living in the average two-bedroom ranch. Is that what's happening? And don't we have a federal mechanism, a state and local mechanism for dealing with abandoned kids living in homes? Don't we have that? No, they've got to go to boarding schools. And how soon do we implement this, right? When the federal government starts deciding which kids belong with the state and not with you. They're already feeding them. They're already going to put these clinics on all the new school buildings. So they, your kids can't bring anything to school, but you, you're darn well sure the schools can provide all sorts of things to your kids medically, even underage, right? The plans of all of this. And of course, federalize, federalizing farce, blaming the victim. Whenever people stand up and protest these things, well, always play the race card, right? In defending a controversial program to raise math and English standards nationwide, the education secretary instead added fuel to the fire. He said some of the pushback is coming from sort of white suburban moms who all of a sudden their child isn't as brilliant as they thought they were. If you're a white suburban mom, you're a soccer mom, right? You know, the ones that voted for Clinton all those years ago. If you're a typical suburban white mom with her kids in her soccer and her cars, and you object to all this uh, in loco parentis, all this big government intervention in, in your family, well, it's just because you can't stand the fact that your kids aren't as smart as you thought you are. You see what Common Core does? What's the common in Common Core? It commonizes education, right? It pulls it down. If you're going to get more and more kids to the same place, 60 million American school kids, you're going to get more and more of those kids to exactly the, the same place in education. By definition, that has to be a lower place, doesn't it? And that's what this is. And the common denominator of all this, what makes it common, is every kid's going to know the same thing. And what that means, if we're going to stop at every kid being able to know and understand the same way, that means that those kids who can know better and understand more and learn more and memorize more and, and succeed more, they have to be cut off. And to do that, you have to remove the parental instinct. You've got to stop thinking of your kids as quantities, as agents who you can make good, better, best. You've got to start thinking of them as part of the collective. Remember uh, Melissa Harris Perry at MSNBC? Got to stop you parents from thinking that the kids belong to you, they belong to the community, right? That's what this is. And how about this idea? And I make this point all the time. They, you've heard for six years now how Common Core is rigorous, right? In fact, that was the key argument for why we should take it. It's so much better, it's so much more rigorous than anything we've ever had before. Please explain to me how they could have known that when it's only been tested the last two months. For the first time in six years, 44 states were tested between April and May, actually between March and May. The first Common Core, and that includes Wisconsin, first Common Core tests were only offered this past semester. How can you call Common Core rigorous? How can you say it's better than what we have when you've only now tested it for the first time a few months ago? There's no way you can know that. And yet they throw the word rigor at you. And when you dare, like these poor moms and dads, right? When you dare to say, how do you know that? You just don't like the fact, you bigot, that your kids aren't as smart as you thought they were, right? 
Let's give the lie to rigor. Let's use their words. You're hearing Arnie Duncan tell it to you. You don't even, I, I'm just the humble moderator here. We're going to let all these people tell you what they think. Here's what Bill Gates says about the rigor of Common Core. It would be great if our education stuff worked, uh, but that we won't you know, know for probably a decade. Six billion dollars of his personal wealth gone to promote, implement, bribe, and propagandize for Common Core. The single biggest private donor to Common Core, he looked you in the eyes two years ago in 2013 and he said, we're at Harvard University and said, we're not going to know until 2023 if it even works. How is that rigorous? This isn't me saying it. This is the guy who bankrolled it. This is the biggest promoter of it on the international stage telling you we're not going to know for 10 years if it works. How can you call that rigorous? And how about the farce of teacher control? They're still peddling that over in Madison, that we have local control of our schools. Our teachers are free to teach however they want to teach. No pressure whatsoever. The standards are just this neutral guide to get kids there any way the teachers want them to. Well, again, listen to Mr. Gates back in 20, uh, 2009, excuse me, when this whole thing was getting rolling. We'll only know if this effort has succeeded when the curriculum and tests are aligned to these standards. Secretary Arne Duncan recently announced that $350 million of the stimulus package will be used to create just these kinds of tests, next generation assessments aligned to the Common Core. When the tests are aligned to the common standards, the curriculum will line up as well. So, which just happened, right? May, April, March, April, May of 2015, the tests have now finally been aligned to the Common Core. What he told you is right. When we finally align the test to the standards, the curriculum will line up as well. The only way we have to measure Common Core are the big, meaningless, one-size-fits-all national standardized tests. That's the only way that anybody's paying attention to. What your teachers report they see with their own eyes, no one's paying any attention to that. All they care about are these tests. If your teachers are going to maintain, get hired in the first place moving forward, if they're going to retain their jobs, if they're going to be promoted, they're going to have to prove that their kids can do a certain score on those tests. That means that whatever the tests demand, the teachers have to teach. Where's the local control? That man, you probably know if you're in the audience today, but a lot of people don't. That liberal Huffington Post calls David Coleman the most powerful educational administrator nobody's ever heard of. That right there is the architect of Common Core. He's been the recipient of all kinds of Bill Gates money. He's the man who organized it. He's the man who ran it. He's the chief. His own Wikipedia site tells you he is the chief architect of the Common Core standards. This man has never been a teacher, never taken a single education course. He has no educational background whatsoever. He is, by his own admission, utterly unqualified to have done this. He's the guy the federal government put in charge of this. And we'll prove that to you in a moment. Listen to what we, I call this the farce, that these are somehow educator-driven standards. That somehow this whole business was done by busy bee teachers working long hours across the states in conjunction with governors and state legislatures to hammer all this out. Listen to this. Here's David Coleman being introduced in 2011 at a leadership meeting at the University of Pittsburgh. He has been involved in virtually every step of setting the national standards, and he doesn't have a single credential for it. He's never taught in an elementary school, I think. I actually don't know. Uh, he's uh, never edited a scholarly journal, but I think he has written scholarly papers, uh, and a variety of other things that have, you know, everybody here has done some of. He hasn't done. You'd think someone with Lauren's experience would understand you never tell the truth when you're introducing someone. I don't know what's more pathetic. The fact that this is the guy that transformed your schools. You never heard of him. Mm -hmm. This is the guy that was responsible for this. He, by his own admission, has no qualifications. I don't know what's more pathetic. That that's who's doing this to you? Or the fact that an entire room full of teachers who take orders from him are laughing at this? Mm -hmm. right? What does that tell you about that, that, that public school mentality when it comes to servitude, right? Somebody gets up there, tells you he has no experience, demonstrates he doesn't know what he's doing, and you fall lockstep behind it, gets even better, right? Here's David Coleman talking about the farce that is educator-driven standard. I actually think it's really important 
to try to base what I'm about to say to you on evidence I share with you rather than on the sands of my qualifications. So if I ask you or talk to you about doing something, it should be evident that it makes sense to you to do because I have no other authority. Because you have no other authority, right? Mm -hmm. This is who's running the show here. Oh, and by the way, you know where he is now, right? Mm -hmm. right? This is the guy that no sooner did he oversee the writing of the Common Core standards than he left Common Core, and now he is the president of the college boards. He's in charge of your kids' SATs. He's rewriting the exams your kids have to, get to take to get into college to conform to his Common Core standards. How does this happen in a constitutional republic? Well, how many of our kids know we're a constitutional republic anymore, right? Mm -hmm. But how does this happen? Unelected, unappointed, unaccountable to you and me. There's no way you and I can get at him. He's the guy that's, that's behind it all. Ultimately, he's being paid to do so by people like Bates, and he's being put there, ultimately, by the current administration. And I'll show that to you, a presidential administration, the federal government. I'll show you that, too, in a minute. But it gets better still, right? David Coleman, talking at the... Uh, uh, leadership Committee again at the University of Pittsburgh. Listen to this. So with that in mind, I'm about to jump in, but I'm just going to say one word about my own organization, which is Student Achievement Partners. Student Achievement Partners, all you need to know about us are a couple of things. One is we're composed of that collection of unqualified people who were involved in developing the common standards. We are that collection of unqualified people who were involved in writing the standards. There you go, right? You get what you pay for, educationally. And this is good too. The stars, the, the, go back to that one, the farce that standard, the, the standards are just standards. They're just these wonderfully benign, apolitical guideposts that teachers help teach to. Well, listen to what he says about that. Right? <laughs> because he's got a, the guy who did all this has a very different uh, opinion about what your teachers are gonna be free to do which is teachers will teach towards the test. There is no force strong enough on this earth to prevent that. There's no amount of hand waving. There's no amount of saying they teach to the standards, not the test. We don't do that here, whatever. Isn't it great that this guy that nobody's ever heard of is bigger than the president, the pope, and the emperor? Because there's no force on this earth that's going to stop your teachers from teaching to our tests. Who controls your kids? It ain't the teachers. It ain't your state and local school boards. It's not the governor, right? Who controls your kids? It's certainly not you. Your kid, and the, the very same guy who did this is now rewriting the SATs, and not just the SATs, but all the advanced placement tests your kids have to take to get college credit in the public schools. He's rewriting all those exams too, which means the curriculum is going to have to change. And how the, the first one he did was history. We'll see that coming up. I'll show you that in a minute. The first exam he rewrote is the advanced placement history exam. It's a doozy. And all the textbooks have to change to conform to his view of American history. Would it surprise you to know that his view of American history is shockingly anti-American? Mm -hmm. And this one kind of gets me too. Remember all that stuff that there's no data mining going on here? Remember all the stuff that this is benign? Remember all the stuff that this is state-led, not federal-led? Remember all the stuff that President Obama had nothing to do with this? The Obama campaign, Arne Duncan had nothing to do with this? This is a private entity. I want you to watch this short montage where he blows all of this out of the water. The, cl the clip I'm about to show you is from 2007, 2008, right when he was working hand in glove by his own admission with the Obama people and how to do this. This whole thing was being set up. Listen to the short clip here. For that, we're partnering with another side of the campaign, of the Obama campaign, that is, with Jeremy on mobilizing, the field mobilization, right? So there's data and there's field mobilization. But we're also talking about communications. We're talking about advocacy and policy. I want to introduce a topic, but as I introduce it, I want to talk about another man who used data to change the world, someone who I admire quite a bit. Because, again, as you think about your power and your force in this world, let's remember who really won the election. Is the person who led the Obama campaign's use of data to galvanize a generation of low-income people to vote like they had never had before? The simple precision and excellence of the use of information to achieve a result is something in my mind that deserves astonishment. It means, again, that there is no force greater. Think about it. Think about it. Hundreds of millions of dollars spent on this campaign and what made the difference, right?
But this incredible precision and insight gained from data, not only knowing where people are, but testing various interventions, seeing what works, keeping focused on delivering them, and that, of course, is Dan Wagner. And they wonder, they might wonder whether we had a legion of talented lobbyists or friends in the right places. Um, Tom, who knows me well, knows how pathetic the beginnings of the Common Core Standard Movement were. Think of a napkin. Think of a few people in a room with an idea. Also talking about communications. We're talking about advocacy and policy. Um, we met the other day on their invitation with the White House because they saw that we were beginning to take the lead on this issue and they saw an opportunity for this country to get something done. That means we shall not rest until these inequities go away. We're partnering with Dan Wagner's team from the campaign on the data side to build to, we have the largest, we actually have the largest set of data perhaps on some counts. We are gonna transform our data systems. They are designed not just to hold data, but to transform data into a force that propels kids forward. We're gonna transform them such that they're not just what happened, but design what's the opportunity gap that we can see coming. What patterns can we see in our data so we can intervene earlier? The forces, for example, in Latino families holding their kids back. And I know it's controversial to describe parenting sometimes as not a force that propels kids forward, but actually holds them back. So we are gonna work very hard over the next five to 10 years. And with that, I shall end. Thank you so much for your attention. Parenting is a force that holds kids back rather than propel them forward. Before the first sentence of the first standard was written, he's talking about how data is the aggregate point here getting information on kids so you can manipulate kids, get information on kids so you can intervene, get information on kids to use data. Do you want your schools run the way they run political campaigns? All right, to use data to influence, to manipulate, to shape, to twist, to seize power? It is amazing what these people tell you. It, they tell you exactly what they did. They tell you exactly how they did it and why. They didn't lie about it. It's right out there in the open. That's what John Gruber's telling you, right? Nobody paid any attention to this. We were too caught up in hope and change. Mm. Right? We were too caught up in tra radical transformation. Right? Consequence of too much wealth and ease, right? this notion that you can pull a pin, pull a plug, and suddenly everything that didn't work is going to work. And you understand the consequence why Mr. Mark said history star it starts first as tragedy, right? Because by not teaching kids the genuine history of the country, not awakening in them a sense of just what it cost to get free and rich, right? that went away in a couple generations. What happened between 48, the generation that survived the Great Depression and won the war? What happened between 1930 and 1948, then between 1948 and 1970 that changed all that? Failure, the second part of our talk today. And uh, some, it's interesting that I got a quote up here from Bill Gates. Because I, anymore, I can't tell if Bill Gates is closer to Karl Marx or closer to the capitalist free market system that made him a billionaire, right? And you think about the irony of Bill Gates' own statement. Bill Gates said, it's fine to celebrate success, but it is more important to heed the lessons of failure. Isn't that amazing? 50 years of this kind of educational reform. Increased federalization, increased centralization, increased expense and cost, much less local control, much more rigorous, meaningless, standardized tests. Been doing it for 50 years. 50 years of failure, Mr. Gates. You say you should heed the lessons of failure. You didn't do it. You didn't do it. It's fine to celebrate success, but it is more important to heed the lessons of failure. Let's talk about failure. Let's start with the Washington State Democrat Party. Why don't you notice the date here, January of 2015. Took six years, but an entire Democrat state legislature, legislature in one of the most Democrat states in the union, four months, uh, five months ago, six months ago now, came out and unilaterally condemned Common Core. Now I'm gonna talk about failure here, because we all know, right, that unless criticism comes from the left, no one on the left's gonna listen to it. Unless criticism comes from progressives, they're not going to listen to criticism. That's so why we've, ha we've had such a long road to hoe, right? So if you've been to my talks, you know. One of the only arguments you get for all the data that's put out there, all the information that we give, all the documentation that we provide, is I just a bunch of right-wingers, right? 
must be right wingers, tea partiers, tea baggers, tinfoil hat wearers. That's the whole argument against anybody who raises an eye about Common Core. Okay, well, let's turn these folks into tea baggers, shall we? How about the entire Central Committee of the Washington State Democrat Party six months ago? The Central Committee of the Washington State Democrat Party passed a resolution roundly condemning the Common Core. The first time a statewide Democrat Party committee has taken a public position against the core, and it happened in the very backyard of Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation, which has provided the funding that made the National Standards Project possible. The Washington Democrats call it a National Standards Project, not a state-led project. The Washington, and you think about what this means. You want to run for office in Washington State? That's on their plat party platform now. Washington state is a Democrat state through and through. There really aren't Republicans out there. Which means if you want Democrat money to run as a Democrat in the state of Washington, you have to accept the party plank. So please tell me what the state of Washington knows that, our own, that the, all these Republican states with Republican governors don't know. What you're about to see, I'm going to read the whole resolution. It's a litany of the evils of Common Core, from, straight from Democrat voices. What do they know that your own state doesn't know? I'm not gonna, I shouldn't mention names, because you very well may be sitting in a state where we can't get anything like a resolution like this, even with Republicans in control of the legislature and the Senate, Senate, the Assembly, and the governor's mansion. Right? Here's what they say. What is it? Whereas the copyrighted and therefore unchangeable Common Core state standards, what are they? They're a set of controversial, top-down academic standards that were promulgated by wealthy private interests, not states and governors and teachers, that were promulgated by wealthy private interests without any research-based evidence or validity, never been tested, and which are developmentally inappropriate in the youngest grades. And whereas, as a means of avoiding the US Constitution's 10th Amendment prohibition against federal meddling in state education policy, I gotta stop and call attention to the fact, what does it say about Common Core that it's forcing Democrats to cite the Constitution of the United States? <laughs> That's kind of a big deal, isn't it? Whereas as a means of avoiding the US Constitution's 10th Amendment prohibition against federal meddling in state education policy, who wrote it? Two unaccountable private trade associations. The National Governors Association and the CCSSO, they received millions of dollars in funding from the Gates Foundation and others to create the core. And whereas the U.S. Department of Education improperly pressured state legislatures into adopting the core and the high stakes tests based on them as a condition of competing for federal race to the top stimulus funds that should have been based on need. And a quick word about that. You heard Bill Gates say it. Did you know? When the outgoing Republican President George Bush in 2008 and the incoming Democrat Obama told you that unless you coughed up billions of your own taxpayer dollars to buy out banks and car companies, the whole economy would crash. Did you know you heard Dave, uh, Bill Gates say it? Hundreds of millions, about $1.1 billion of the stimulus package went directly to the Department of Education. What were you bailing them out from? Do you honestly think the federal Department of Education was going to go bankrupt given the way the feds spend money on themselves? Why did your stimulus dollars go to the Federal Department of Education to begin to create the tests even before the standards were written? You go ahead and call it state-led all you want, but no one's buying it. Gruber's right. The truth doesn't really change the needle here much for too many people. It's a problem. But they go on to say, right? The implementation of Common Core will cost local school districts hundreds of millions of dollars to pay for standardized computer-based tests, new technology, curricula, teacher training, at a time when Washington State is already insufficiently funding K-12 basic education. All of this without any proven benefit to students. And whereas some states have already withdrawn from Common Core. Therefore, be it resolved that we call upon the Washington State Legislature and the superintendent of public instruction to withdraw from Common Core and keep K-12 education student-centered and accountable to the people of Washington State. That's Washington. And you know, right? We've got some folks from California here, so I'm exempting you from the statement. You know that Democrats in Washington State are really more like progressives, right? The Californians understand this. Who ruined Cali Washington State to begin with, right? California, you see the problem here. <laughs> 
What does it tell you? And wh where is that in Wisconsin, Governor Walker? Where is it in Ohio, Governor Kasich? Hey, Chris Christie, where is it in New Jersey? Hey, Governor Scott, where is it in Florida? And you know the theme that keeps coming up again and again and again, given that Republicans control the lion's share of state legislatures in this country? Nothing from them. They're not on your team. The, really? The Washington Democrats? Six months ago. Everything they just told you, we've been saying for five years. Everybody's been warning you about. And then, okay, it's state-led. We get you then. If that's true, shouldn't states be able to walk away from it? But they can't, can they? Every time a state tries to distance itself from this monstrosity, the Fed comes in and bullies and threatens. Notice the date, April 2015. You saw what happened. The last, one of the last great vestiges of American entrepreneurship, of, America, of American freedom rabble-rousing. Moms and dads opting their kids out of these tests all across the country. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands, whole, school, whole classes of schools, whole districts refusing to take the tests. Right? And again, if this is state-led, and every state in the union legally allows moms to opt out of tests, then what's your big beef if this is state-led? So what happens, though? As opt-out numbers grow, one, two months ago in April, as opt-out numbers grow, Arne Duncan says, feds may have to step in. U.S. Education Secretary Arne Duncan said Tuesday that federal government is obligated to intervene if states fail to address the rising number of students who are boycotting the mandated annual exams. Well, who mandated them? States have no provision. You can opt out in every state, including Wisconsin. They're mandated by the feds. How do you say Common Core is state-led? If, if that's a little wink to the states. Either you pass laws to force every one of your kids into those tests, or we will step in and do it for you. This, I'm just keep, uh, mafia keeps coming up to me, right? <laughs> Duncan's comments come as an opt-out advocacy group in New York, hardly a conservative state, reports that more than 184,000 students statewide out of 1.1 million eligible test takers, refuse the exams. 15% of all New York students. He also said, Arne Duncan, that tests are, quote, just not a traumatic event, unquote, for his children who attend public schools in Virginia. Quote, it's just part of most kids' education growing up. Sometimes adults make a big deal that creates some trauma for the kids. So moms and dads who object to the tests, see, once again, you're traumatizing the kids. Isn't it funny with all this bullying curriculum in the schools that nobody ever stops to consider that perhaps the biggest bully we have in this country is the federal government? Right? Just ask people who've been audited for their Tea Party activities by the IRS about that. Has anybody been fired for that yet? They didn't think so. Right? <laughs> I call this Big Brother Threatens, right? The city of Chicago, also not a cons So we got really liberal New York, we got really liberal Washington State, we got really, really liberal Chicago. What happened in Illinois? In Illinois, the city of Chicago refused to give the test to only, gave the test to only 10% of their population. 600 schools in Chicago. They're only testing 60. They refuse. They call the tests a complete waste of time. They talk, talk about how these tests are too much federal government intrusion into state and local control. That's what Chicago says. The interesting thing is, every other school district throughout Illinois is 100% on board with Common Core. 99% of the state is giving these exams to their schools, except Chicago, who will only give them to 10% of their schools. For that, Arne Duncan and the federal... By the way, what, what authority does a Department of Education secretary have to threaten anything. Who is he? He's a, the president's cabinet, he's an appointment. What power to, under the Constitution, what power in the founding documents does Arne Duncan have to impose any penalties on anybody for anything? And yet here you have it, simply because Chicago, and remember Washington State, Barack Obama's, or uh, Bill Gates' own backyard? Well, this is in Barack Obama's backyard, right? Mm -hmm. The city of Chicago's doing this? Mm -hmm. So what happened? Notice the date, January of this year. Feds threatened to take away $1 billion in school funding from Illinois. Chicago Public Schools' decision to administer new Common Core tests to only about 10% of the city's 600 schools could cost the state over $1 billion in federal aid. In a recent letter to Illinois School Superintendent Christopher Koch, 
Former Assistant U.S. Education Secretary Deborah Delisle made it clear that the state could lose as much as $1.17 billion in federal education funding next year if Chicago schools don't comply with Common Core testing requirements. Bullying, right? Mm -hmm. Intimidation, threats. This is federal. This is a federal takeover of education. And then there's this, right? The, we, the, the Washington State Democrats pointed this out to you. Whatever money your state got for taking Common Core through Race to the Top, it wasn't enough. California received easily $900 million from the federal government to take Common Core. And it's going to cost them about a billion dollars a year just to administer the tests. So you get a one-time windfall of about $900 million, And you already, the first year you employ it, you're already in the red. Notice the date, January of this year. Districts seek reimbursement for Common Core test costs. The state of California could be liable for as much as $1 billion a year in costs if a group of school districts succeeds in winning reimbursement for expenses associated with the implementation of computer-based tests in the Common Core and other new state standards. For unified school districts, Santa Ana, Vallejo, Plumas, and Porterville, and the Plumas County Office of Education filed a claim to classify the new tests as state mandates. Well, don't they have to be? The schools didn't take Common Core, the state took it. Wisconsin, your state took it. D Tony Evers, the DPI secretary, took it in conjunction with Governor Doyle. That was it. Took it. That means all the school districts had to use it. Immediately, they all transformed. Of course, the tests are state mandates, which means guess who's going to have to pay for that, California? I hate to break it to you. Your taxes are going up, right? They're going to have to. Where are you going to get this money from? You don't think it's going to be the same thing here? Who's going to pay for all of this? There are a lot of rural school districts in Wisconsin that don't have the bandwidth capacity to be able to do this on a consistent basis. Where's the money going to come from? The feds aren't going to keep pumping it into your state. If the Commission of State Mandates agrees, the state will be required to reimburse, reimburse all districts statewide to recover costs. The only option those schools have, by the way, if the state doesn't admit to do it, is they go bankrupt, they go out of business. Those are your two choices, close schools or the state's going to have to pay for them. There's no other choice. Right? And that's what the feds have done to you. Now that you bought all the textbooks, Wisconsin, now that you put them in all your schools, school superintendents, now school boards, now that you adopted all of this and won't dare walk away from it because you're so afraid of what Tony Evers might say to you, now you have to live with the consequences, right? Now you either shutter the schools or the state's going to have to cough up that money. And then we've got this, ideology. So if this isn't about education, I mean, it's, I'm almost embarrassed to talk to you this way. Because if you've been paying any attention for the last three years of all these lessons and assignments and textbooks and pedagogy and lesson plans, you cannot help but notice how shockingly ideological, how shockingly sexualized, how shockingly political, even science like math and history and English, all of them are becoming. Again, if you've got a sociologist in charge of this, you've got somebody like David Coleman, whose main ambition is social justice and equity. It's not about teaching kids. You understand that? If you make education about equity, then it's not about excellence. Because we're not all the same educationally. Some of us read very well, way beyond our years. Others of us do math really poorly, way below our years. <laughs> so what? So what? Education is excellent when it allows people to become what their God-given talents are. Mm -hmm. Equity education says that it's not right that I got to read so quickly, but I also couldn't do math so, so young. So let's level the playing field. Let's pull everybody who can do more down and equalize the playing field. That's what this is. And that's why they're bringing in all the sociological garbage. Notice the date. A couple of days ago, June of this year. States adopt green common core science standards that indoctrinate on climate change. The intense unpopularity of the federally funded common core math and English language arts standards and their associated tests isn't stopping states from further signing on to federally driven green common core science standards, a program which will ensure children are well versed from an early age in politically correct climate change ideology. Released in April of 2013, the next generation science standards have already been officially adopted by 13 states in Washington, D.C. Their promoters claim that they are another state-led endeavor 
managed by Achieve, the same progressive nonprofit that was funded by the Gates to develop and promote the Common Core Standards. 13 different states, the District of Columbia, and notice something else here too. There will be no Common Core Standards anymore named Common Core. You hate Common Core, so the next generation science standards are it. They're not calling them Common Core because you don't like them. All right? And notice how, Wisconsin, you had to be asked to take English and math. Shouldn't you have to be asked to take science or history or gym for that matter? But they're not asking anymore. Now they're just blending it all together. You took the two, now you're going to get all of them, whether you like it or not. How do you stop that train from running? Continuing. The most important justification, uh, this, is, this is directly from the framework of how they're going to teach your kids. At every grade level, starting from five years old through high school, the key point of science, not an adjunct point, is teaching your kids climate change. Not necessarily ratios or formulas, not necessarily scientific method, not hypotheses, not basic uh, lab exercises anymore. It's teaching them the propaganda. In its framework, chapter seven focuses on the disciplinary core ideas, earth and space sciences. And the third core idea, ESS, is titled Global Climate Change from the framework, quote, the most important justification for the framework's increased emphasis on earth and space science is the rapidly increasing relevance of earth science to so many aspects of human society. It may seem as if natural hazards, such as earthquakes and hurricanes, have been more active in recent years. But this is primarily because the growing population of cities has heightened their impact. So, all right, we're going to start off climate change by talking about hurricanes and earthquakes. Not a single legitimate science, climate scientist says either one of those things can be traced to any kind of global warming. But we're going to start there. And then we're going to use it as a slick trick to turn in population control. You know why you're all dying from climate change. It's because you have too big cities. Too many of you live, too many of you alive, too many of you living in cities, right? Too many of you bunch together. We've got to fix that, don't we? The framework goes on to explain that, quote, global climate models, unquote, predict that, quote, average global temperatures will continue to rise, unquote. Nowhere do you learn in the curriculum that 95% of United Nations climate models radically overestimated the amount of warming there was, 95%. Global climate models, right? And when you're talking of what does a global, global climate model actually have to do with the kind of science you want to teach little kids? This isn't science, right? You're teaching them models. And we've seen from East Anglia to Penn State and across the United Nations how these models have been manipulated, rigged. And I should also say, too, I'm not averse to kids learning about climate. I'm not averse to kids. Do, but when that's all you're learning, when there is, it's not, as Dr. Sandra Stotsky points out, it's not critical thinking if all kids are getting one view of things. If all they're being presented with over and over again, year after year, starting from five and not finishing until they're 18, then they go to college where they get more of it, mm. right? The framework goes on to explain that global climate models predict average global temperatures will continue to rise and that these outcomes will, quote, depend on the amounts of human-generated greenhouse gases added to the atmosphere. It's clear from the framework that fossil fuels are to be viewed as a source of energy that is incompatible with being an effective member of the U.S. workforce and a model citizen of the world. That's the objective. That if you, you put gasoline in your car, you use petroleum projects, you use plastic or lip balm or medical supplies, well then you're not an effective citizen. For, you're not ready for the American workforce. And you're certainly not a model citizen of the new global world. Right? What your kids are getting. How about this? Oh, the whole white privilege agenda. You, if you've been watching the news, notice the date on this, May of 2015. Do you see the big scandal next door in Minnesota? St. Paul School District over the last five years, $3.5 million dollars spent of taxpayer money on incorporating white privilege curriculum. School districts spending millions on what white privilege training for employees. And if you go look at your Common Core textbooks in English, go look at what Pearson Publishing has done and see the connections here between what's going on in Common Core. The Pacific Education Group, PEG, espouses a lot of controversial and stereotypical concepts regarding minority students in K-12 schools. For instance, the organization teaches that black kids are less likely to respond to fundamental ideas like working hard to achieve success or being on time for school or work because those ideas are supposedly foreign to African-American culture. 
Can you imagine if a conservative said that? Holy cow, they're talking about colored people time. Can you imagine if a conservative said this, that black people have their own clocks, they don't show up for things? But this is now part of the curriculum they're teaching in schools right across the border in Minneapolis, St. Paul. PEG is literally selling notions like that to American public schools. And the schools are buying them at a cost, at cost of millions of taxpayer dollars every year. Teachers are actually encouraged by PEG to segregate children in class by race. Teachers are also taught that they should have separate behavior expectations for minority students because those students supposedly come from cultures with radically different values. For instance, one of the annual white privilege conferences in Wisconsin taught participants that minority kids frequently have, quote, a different value in view of time, missed days working together, and wait time between questions and answers, unquote. According to PEG, white culture is based on, quote, white individualism, unquote, or white traits like rugged individualism, adherence to rigid time schedules, planning for the future. That's a white guy thing, right? And the idea that hard work is the key to success. Minority students shouldn't be expected to subscribe to those values because they are foreign to their culture. You understand that this is chaos, right? The very same, and hasn't it always been this way? The very same progressives who have been most screaming in your ear about how bigoted you are, don't they always turn out to be the biggest racists? Go to a university campus and see how they silence speech, how they punish dissenting opinion in the name of tolerance and inclusion. Endless, right? That guy, one of the guys who wrote the Common Core English Standards, David Pook, right? Listen to his reason why he helped write the English Standards. I'm not, I'm not just an interested teacher who helped write the standards. And the reason why I helped write the standards and the reason why I am here today is that as a white male in society, I am given a lot of privilege that I didn't earn. So David Pook did not help write the standards to let kids read better or write better or think better. He wrote them because he's a white guy who has too much privilege. And he wants to make sure your kids know in their English assignments just how privileged unfairly he was, right? What's going on? What do I mean when I tell you that this has nothing to do with education, right? Failing Americans history, right? We talked a little bit about David Coleman. David Coleman, who's in charge of the architect of the Common Core, David Coleman, who's rewriting the SATs, so your kids will get into college only if they do certain score a certain number on his Common Core-based test now. Same guy is rewriting the AP exams, and he started with his, no surprise, he starts with history, right? Because history starts as tragedy, and then only when you control it does it become farce. Rising alarm over radical changes that have been made to the Advanced Placement AP American History Program, a program heavily supported by federal and state funds, by the way, we're paying for this. The College Board is a private entity. It's not a public trust. Why is, do they get to decide what your kids, your PSATs, your SATs, why do they decide, your GEDs, why do they decide what exams your kids take to get into college? Who authorizes them to do this? The voice of the people has been muted because corporatists and other elites have figured out how to end run our constitutional structure. The College Board, led by David Coleman, is rewriting its AP history courses, starting with AP US History, or APUSH. The new APUSH framework departs radically from traditional AP course and now reflects progressive philosophy and leftist bias. Forget the founding fathers and the principles of the Declaration of Independence that proclaim the natural rights and freedom of self-government. Concentrate instead on the racist cultural imperialism that supposedly built America. To objections, when David Coleman was a, when university professors from all, history professors from all across the country protested to David Coleman, that this was an inaccurate, including many liberal professors, that this was an inaccurate vision of Amer version of American history. You know what he said? Facts don't matter in history anyway. <laughs> to objections that students will learn an inaccurate version of American history, the College Board responds that facts aren't all that important anyway. What's important are historical thinking skills, contextualization, and crafting historical arguments. In other words, don't need to know what happened and why it happened. All you need to know is the narrative the textbook wants you to learn. Here's why we're an ra ir irredeemably racist country. Here's why we're an irredeemably imperialist country. Here's why we are an irredeemably sexist country. Those, we want them to make those arguments, right? 
Failing Americans History, September 2014, end of last year, Pioneer Institute. Common Core ELA standards will further harm history instruction. And you know what they're doing with Common Core English, right? English language arts. They won't be teaching history or social studies anymore. History and social studies are being funneled into the English language arts. So you already took the English language arts. So they're not going to roll out Common Core history. History is now being taught in ELA. So too is every other aspect of this. Common Core ELA standards, why are they telling you that? Common Core ELA standards will further harm US history instruction because there aren't, isn't going to be any more history instruction. The history they get is going to be in their English classes. States and schools should offer separate standards and classes for English and US history. Rather than follow the Common Core approach of merging academic disciplines by trying to include US history in English language arts, Common Core will further damage history instruction. According to a new study authored by a preeminent founding era historian, a contents expert, and a high school history teacher with national standards experience. Imperiling the Republic, the fate of US history instruction under Common Core. You can go to the uh, Pioneer Institute website and read it for free, their analysis of what's happening here. Published by the Pioneer Institute, analyzes literacy standards for US history that are included as part of Common Core's English language arts standards. The College Board's new AP US history curriculum further mirrors the ideological biases of progressive edu edu education. This is the Pioneer Report. It begins with a series of negative and divisive themes that are heavily focused on the balkanizing formation of gender, class, race, and ethnicity. Quote, it's like the bad and the ugly of American history without any of the good, unquote, said co-author Anders Lewis. For example, there are no themes at all, no sp time spent at all, talking about federalism, the separation of powers, the Federalist Papers, or even the Gettysburg Address. The curriculum doesn't ask teachers to teach about Benjamin Franklin and contains no mention of Thomas Jefferson or James Madison. The events of 11 September 2001 are never referred to as a terrorist attack. Say what you will about Tom Jefferson, had some really goofy ideas. But I always go back to what John F. Kennedy said from the White House. In 1960, President Kennedy was hosting a group of Nobel Prize winners for that year at the White House. All these great minds. And he got up at dinner, President Kennedy, to give a little salute. And he said, you know, not since we have not had this collection of brain power in the White House since Thomas Jefferson dined here alone, right? The argue, love him or hate him, arguably the single most important intellectual produced in the Western Hemisphere, not mentioned once in Common Core. Right? Quote, Common Core dramatically reduces the amount of classic American literature and poetry students will read in favor of nonfiction or so-called information text, said co-author Sandy Stotsky. Consequently, the writers of the national standards attempted to shoehorn little bits and pieces of uncontextualized US history into the English standards. The simultaneously result damages instruction both for English and for US history learning. And now notice the date. This actually came out yesterday. 55 now university professors have signed a letter. And there are, I'm told by St Stanley Kurtz has got a, a blog up on this. There are hundreds of other professors now begging to sign on to this as well. This is just the first iteration. 50 esteemed history scholars protest AP US history changes. Defenders of the College Board's controversial new APUSH framework like to paint their opponents as ignorant chauvinists who want to censor out the bad bits of American history. In other words, we're back to name calling, racism, and soccer momism. Can I invent that word? I'll trademark it. Soccer momism, right? <laughs> Anything that middle America likes at the federal government is soccer momism, right? It's a hideous racism that must be combated. That's going to be awfully hard to do now that 55 distinguished historians, Americanists, and educational specialists have issued a powerful condemnation of the College Board's revisionist history. The statement signatories make it clear that they do favor a warts and all account of American history, but that's what we always had. We're a lot older, most of us, than the kids who are going to school now, but I remember learning. It, it, the thing is, is that you don't learn anything but the negatives now. I, mean, I learned all about slavery, right? But I learned about a lot of other things too. Now it's one, I, I tell you, there's not one, and I ask my kids all the time at my university courses, I don't have one kid in a thousand who recognizes the history, who could tell you anything about the history of slavery in the world anywhere but in the United States. 
They can tell you all about American slavery. They can't tell you about Bunker Hill. They can't tell you much about anything else. They don't know anything about World War II. Vietnam may as well have been Magna Carta. They don't know anything of it. But they can tell you a lot about civil rights. And they can tell you a lot about uh, slavery. Two important subjects, but when that's all they know coming out of high school, you got a very skewed bunch of kids, right? as they say here. The statement signatories make it clear that they favor a warts and all account of American history that nonetheless emphasizes the ways in which, quote, we remain one nation with common ideals and a shared story. That's the part that's missing from all of this. Right? And I want to remind you of something. We mentioned Obama. You heard Arne Dunk, uh, David Coleman talk about his linking up with Barack Obama. We talked about all that stimulus money that was shuffled to the Department of Education by the Obama administration. Well, let's just pause for a moment and do, let's do a little study in hypocrisy. This is President Obama in 2007 before he was elected president. Listen to him address the NEA and listen to him condemn, absolutely condemn, one size fits all big test education. Here's what he said. Don't tell us that the only way to teach a child is to spend too much of a year preparing him to fill out a few bubbles in a standardized test. We know that's not true. We know that's not true. Don't tell us that the purpose of education is just to prepare kids for meaningless tests. Where is that guy? Oh, he got elected twice, right? Because everything he's done since then absolutely contradicts what he just said. His let them tell you what they, th th it is shocking. When you contrast that to what he said for the last seven, six, going on seven years now, about the nature of tests, how kids have to take them, right? Let's see if, if President Obama's correct, right? Because there's all kinds of evidence out there about testing, even on the liberal comedy shows. This is the John Oliver last week tonight HBO. It's kind of a John Stewart ripoff, right? Faux news. But every once in a while, this guy, gets, he's, a, he's a Brit, where they actually do education considerably better. Every once in a while, they really come out with this. This is worth you listening to. If standardized tests are bad for teachers and bad for kids, who exactly are they good for? Well, it turns out they're operated by companies like all these. And let's just focus on the largest one, Pearson. As of 2012, they had nearly 40% of the testing market, almost triple their nearest competitor. And if you've never heard of them, then congratulations. But just mention their name to any parent or teacher in a state they operate in, and you see what happens. A hypothetical girl could take Pearson tests from kindergarten through at least eighth grade, uh, by, tests, by the way, that she studied for using Pearson curriculum and textbooks taught to her by teachers who were certified by their own Pearson test. If at some point she was tested for a learning disability, like ADHD, that's also a Pearson test. And if she eventually got sick of Pearson and dropped out, well, she'd have to take the GED, which is now, guess what, also a Pearson test. Their track record is littered with complaints concerning technical glitches, slow grading, and even the contents of their tests. Take, take what happened in New York just a few years ago. Almost 30 different test questions have now been declared invalid because they're confusing or have outright errors. They'd already pulled six questions from an English exam related to a bizarre passage about a talking pineapple. Students had to answer questions about the story, which they say goes like this. A pineapple challenges a hare to a race. Other animals figure the fruit has a trick up its sleeve, but the hare wins and the animals eat the pineapple. It ends with the moral, pineapples don't have sleeves. I was really confused because uh, I expected a lot more from them. That article about the pineapple and the hair was stupid and absurd. It's really shocking when you think about it. I mean, Pearson Publishing, they own 40% of the testing market. They own 80% of the American textbook market right now. 40% of all the tests, 80% of the texts your kids can buy textbooks your kids can buy are Pearson. 92% of all Common Core textbooks are Pearson Publishing textbooks. All right. Common, Pearson Publishing owns 100% of the Canadian textbook market, all of it. All right. It's a British company. Did you know that your federal government last year paid Pearson Publishing $350 million to create materials for classrooms? That's what their job is. So your federal government is paying Pearson to do what it otherwise would have done then Pearson is selling all that junk to states like Wisconsin and keeping all the profits. That's what we call crony capitalism, right? In conjunction with this big government stuff. That's how this happens, right? But it gets even better. You know who's grading all these exams? <laughs> Not teachers. Do you know where they're getting the graders for your kids' exams? They're taking out ads on Craigslist. Mm -hmm. 
No, I'm serious. Listen to this. The company posted this ad to Craigslist. It's to find people to grade the exams. We looked at an essay every two minutes, a short answer every five seconds, every 10 seconds. We don't understand your kids. We don't understand anyone's kids. I was told when I was beginning a project that last year, you know, there were a certain amount of twos, a certain amount of threes, a certain amount of fours. We expect that to be similar this year. If that's not similar, they will tell you, we're scoring too many threes, we're scoring too many fours. And they'll say, you have to learn to see more papers as a three. You have to learn to see more papers as a four. And what exactly is the psychometry behind this? What exactly is the, psycho the, the scientific method behind this? Take out an ad. I wouldn't take out an ad on Craigslist for anything. God knows who'd be knocking at, sending you selfies across the internet. I wouldn't be messing with that, period. But you're getting your graders for Common Core, for these, these big national tests. You're getting the graders from Craigslist. And then they're doing this holistic scoring garbage. Where, did you hear the fella? We were looking at an essay every five seconds, a short answer every five seconds. We got to glance at them and move on. We got to take an almost a, a quick snapshot in our brains of what they are, assign them a grade and move on, assign them a score and move on. These tests are meaningless. They don't do anything but make big testing companies rich and provide lots and lots of data to the feds. That's what the fed gets. All that data, all that control that David Coleman said, think about it, he said, like the little mad genius that he is. Think about the power, being able to manipulate all that data on your kids and your families, mm -hmm. to intervene the way we want to intervene, to shape what your kids do. That's what they get, right? And it gets even better. I, you know, I, I'm going to do this because I think it's interesting. I, want, uh, I have said, if you've been to my talks, and if you haven't, you could find there's way too many versions on the internet. I'm not a vain man. I didn't put them up there. People come to the talks, they put little cameras, and they, so they put it, so whatever you see on the internet is largely unedited, so I don't know what's up there, but there's a lot. But if you go look at any of my talks on the internet, you will see I make it abundantly clear. I've made it clear here. This is not a particularly political issue. It's not a Democratic problem or a Republican problem. I, in my 40 states, I'm going to reiterate this, I've had a bigger problem with Republicans and Democrats. The Democrats all want it. They want it. Name one Democrat governor out there, out there telling you you should take this. Name one Democrat governor out there telling you how well they're not. They keep their mouths shut. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you got the Christies of the world who apparently tried to do it. He's polling badly now, so he's trying to get out of it. <laughs> but for four years, you had Christie mocking people who oppose Common Core. Kasich in, in Ohio, this mm -hmm. gunslinging Republican. The governor of Wisconsin, mm -hmm. who is running around claiming he killed Common Core mm -hmm. in this state. And the 40 states I've been in, they're all laughing at him for it. They don't believe that for a second. You don't kill it and then enshrine it. And I like Governor Walker, but on this issue, he's, no, he's not demonstrated himself any better on these things. So having said that now to you, I, 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 sorry to say it, that's my experience, it's what I believe. The, the Republican legislatures that I've talked to and all, I've testified before 15 of them now, it's always the same thing. The Democrats just keep quiet. This is good for them. It's big government, it's centralization. That's why the, the Washington State Dems were such a remarkable turn. But I've been told by Republicans from Florida, to Massachusetts, to see it, to Washington, to California, I've been told. Give us some more seats in the House. Re-elect us to Congress. Give governors back their jobs and we'll move. We were told that in Wisconsin for the last three years. We did it. Nothing. We got that accountability bill, right? All that would have done, and they're going to put a slip it in the budget anyway, but it was killed. All the accountability does is, the bill does is make you accountable to the existing system, which is Common Core based, and fix anything. And yet, shockingly, our governor is out there claiming he killed Common Core. People aren't buying it. Having said that, as prelude to this, I think it's worth reminding you. Remember back in 2008 when we elected the president and all that creepy video of public school kids being forced to sing paeans and anthems to the great new president? I want to remind you of that real quick. We're going to spread happiness. We're going to spread free. Obama's gonna change it, Obama's gonna lead them. Now's the moment where each voice is sing, sing with all your heart. For our children, for our families, nations all join as one.
Now ask yourself what would have happened if you had American public schools compelling kids to sing that way about President Bush. <laughs> what do you think would have happened? That's Orwellian creepy. I don't care who the president is. When you're doing that stuff, what are you doing to kids' minds with that? I love the one, uh, red and yellow, black and white, they're all equal in his sight. You remember the old song? That's yeah. Jesus Loves the Little Children, right? Yeah. Red and yellow, black and white, they're all precious in his sight. And so you see, you pull Jesus out, you put Barack in, and precious is replaced with equal because equity, because social justice, because common and common core, because all this stuff, right? That's what they're doing. And why do I bring that up? Because you think about how bad these tests are. You think about how meaningless and bad and corrupt and expensive and uh, irrelevant these tests are to actually anything that goes on in a classroom, these big national tests. You think about liberal comedians, the British John Stewart, mocking those tests with a zeal that you would attribute to a Tea Partier. When you see that, and then you see that, watch this. This is what your public schools are doing about the tests. Get your number two pencils out. Your number two pencils out. Get your number two pencils out. What the test say? So moms and dads across the country are voicing their concern with their children that these meaningless tests have, they're stressful, they don't measure accurately, they tell nothing important. Moms and dads are trying to change the testing system, pull kids out, and your public schools are taking those children and forcing them to do stuff like this in public schools during class time. Right. Who really owns your kids? When they can take your kids, to remember, you remember back when Obamacare was going through before it had passed? And you remember when Barack Obama was going to local high schools, traveling the country, and he was telling high school kids, I need you to convince your parents mm -hmm. that what I'm doing is right. Mm -hmm. right. Remember what Abe Lincoln said, the philosophy of the classroom in one generation is the philosophy of government in the next. It just takes one generation. Um, one of the great uh, Marxist revolutionaries when the Soviet Union was pulled apart, right, he was talking about uh, parliament and he said, let the Christian Democrats have parliament. We'll take the kids. Mm -hmm. right? Just give us the kids. And that's what happened. Mm -hmm. right? What happened in the schools? Where did Bill Ayers, the unrepentant war, uh, Pentagon bomber who couldn't get a job anywhere else, what did he end up doing for the last 30 years? Mm -hmm. Became a professor of education, right? Mm -hmm. Give me the kids, right? It just takes one generation of poorly miseducated kids to completely transform the whole country. And what do you make about six and seven and eight year olds chanting in, uh, rhythmically, yes we can, 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 yes we can, can, can. And I, what's more shocking than the moms and dads sitting there with these smiles on their faces? Right. And ladies and gentlemen, I, for, all you, for all you Star Trek fans out there, I had to con wind it up this way. The farce is with us, right? I, and I love, the, I love the, cre the creepy nuclear toxic waste green that makes her hair look green. But I want you to notice this, right? This is two months ago in Iowa on the campaign trail because if the election were tomorrow, there's your next president in spite of all the scandals and the incompetence. There's your next president right now if the vote was held. And so I want you to hear what she said about education. This is the woman, at least 30 years, 20 years ago, she told us it took a village. Mm -hmm. I assume you get to be part of your own, I assume that, that she meant you could be part of your own village. Listen to what she said on the campaign trail about Common Core in education just two months ago. You know, when I think about the really unfortunate argument that's been going on around Common Core, it's very painful. How did we end up at a point where we are so um, 
negative about the most important non-family enterprise in the raising of the next generation, which is how our kids are educated. How can we be so cynical? Education is a non-family enterprise. It doesn't belong to you. All right, that's the most, single most important thing your kids are going to do that doesn't involve family is education. And I, I've said this before. You know, there is no more intimate thing that you can do with your children than teach them. Uh, from the moment they're born, you're teaching them. You're speaking at them. You are holding colors and shapes up to them. You're dangling things. That, well, they're not cats, but you're dangling things in front of them. That the intimacy, the bond between moms and dads and fathers and children, it comes from education. For far too long in this country, we have decided that it was fit and right and proper to turn our kids eight hours a day, every day, over to federal government schools. It had to be this way. Government looks out for itself. That's why your founding fathers, you know, uh, as th that's why they've done away with them in the A-Push framework, because a good read of what, what Jefferson and Madison what the, and Adams had to say, more or less, is going to remind you of these things. They're not going to give you that anymore. But what they all said the same thing. When the bigger government gets, the more government looks after itself, not you and not your kids. Mm. And that's where we fell down. We opened that door. We dropped our kids off for a glorified eight hours a day of federal babysitting. You really ought to ask the question, why didn't this happen sooner? Mm. But, there, but I don't see a way to fix this corruption anymore. Mm. You see, and that's why I'm so hard on the Republicans. Because yeah. they're the ones who look you in the eye and tell you they understand. They're the ones who've looked me in the eye and thousands of more people like me and said to us, we want to fix this. But then you give them power and what? Weren't they the same ones who were going to get rid of Obamacare? Have you heard that mentioned yeah. since November? I haven't heard it mentioned. Weren't they the ones who were going to uh, enforce the, I haven't heard that mentioned either, the border enforcement. Yeah. And they told us all too that Common Core was a big deal to them. They, want, they understood the sanctity of the parent-child relationship, but they don't. They just don't. You, we really don't have two parties anymore. But you know what you do have to the degree that you can still <coughs> exercise it? You have the freedom to educate your kids yourself. If we, and I understand two, there's a reason we have a two-family economy. It's not an accident that we now have an economy that, that requires many moms and dads. It's not an accident. Because the more moms and dads are out of the house, the more the kids can be controlled. Right? That's what federal schools became. You heard Alex Newman. That's what Horace Mann had in mind for public school education. That's what John Dewey wanted. That you can go to a, every major state and every major state capital in this country, you will find statues honoring Dewey and honoring uh, uh, Horace Mann, the two men whose visionary belief of that American public schools were designed to undermine freedom, undermine the government, undermine parental rights and control. You still have an opportunity. Right? I, I just, I don't, and if you pull Common Core out of the state of Wisconsin tomorrow, it's still going to be in the schools. Because you honestly think it's funny. Your school somehow found the money five, four and five years ago, didn't they? After all the poor mouth and the, the, the bleeding about it, our schools found money to get all the new Common Core stuff. Mm -hmm. We found it. We found money to throw out the old stuff. We got, and that's why Pearson was giving stuff away, bribing p uh, schools and school boards. Right, you found the money to take it. Now we're told if you get rid of Common Core, we can't afford to get rid of this. We can't afford to buy new stuff. In states like Texas that never took Common Core, never ever took it, in the schools all over the place. Mm -hmm. In states that pulled out of Common Core, like Oklahoma, teachers are teaching it anyway. Mm -hmm. School districts are impl implementing it anyway. So you're not going to, by simply legally getting rid of this, you're not going to fix anything. The one where I want to leave you, if I, know, I got involved with this three years ago very reluctantly. Mm -hmm. Because running a school like, helping to run a school like this, being involved in a school like this, I could see this thing <coughs> coming down the tracks, right? Mary Black who's here, my colleague, she, po she, she was the one who, right here, sorry. <laughs> she, she pointed it out to me, right? I didn't even know about it. Mary was on this before I was, but that's part of the problem we have. E either you find yourself a really good private or Christian school that is guaranteed Common Core free, or you do it yourself. And I think that's the problem. Because when you think about the kind of social incohesion we have, you think about the kind of uh, unmoored culture, a lot of it has to start with families. Kids learn their values. Well, it's changing now where kids get their values from. But that's because we're letting it. Educating your children yourself, participating in your kids' education any way you can. Be, even if you got them in the public schools, be an, an involved mom and dad who sits through classes, who goes to school board. Well, when we have a school board election in Wisconsin, what does it turn out? Seven, eight percent? Mm -hmm. right? Nobody votes in those things. Mm -hmm. 
And that's no disrespect. We got good school board people here, people, moms and dads who, and Mary, I'm looking at Mary Carney here, who, who one of the ways she went about fixing it was to get herself elected to the school board, right? Now she's facing how many hostile opponents? Yeah. The six, he's her and six others, right? It's just the way it is. But at some point, what they say about America is true. You get the government you deserve. And so we either wake up, and, and I'll say this by way of closing. I have never met a homeschool mom, never, ever met a homeschool mom who ever regretted doing it. It's always the same thing. I wish I'd done it sooner. If you're, you're, you're working hard, you're, you're saving money, you're doing all these things, but you lose your kids, is it worth it? What profit of a man if he gained the whole world and loses soul?